people who have the industry exposure. Like in KGI, there is one of the faculty who has worked with USFDA. So she comes and teaches the students, right? In uh, Ramaya College also, there are people, one who works in the industry in Sinjin and who is uh, now left and is into teaching area. There's another professor also in that area. And if the faculties do not have, suppose they have been completely in the academic area, we bring them to Biocon. We spend two weeks training them on the industry part of it, showing them the industry, telling them what happens in the industry, and then they teach the students. So the focus here is that the education partner will give application-oriented teaching. They will constantly evaluate the students. They will see that they, the certification is given by these institutes. So if KGI is giving a certificate, it is a US-based certificate. So there is credit points associated to that also, right? So you get certificate from these properly governed education bodies, and they have proper evaluation systems. They have learning management systems. So they score you, they me you measure you at every stage. They ensure that there is projects to do, that there is case studies, that the students are interacting with. So that is the role of the education partner. So if you join Bioconomy, your morning first half goes with the education partner teaching in application oriented way. The second part, which is the functional visit part here. Right. So at this part is where you will actually go into the industry. What happens here, the students go into the, if you take an example of Biocon or Fujin, where they go and uh, learn, they spend at least two weeks in each of the departments. Every afternoon, they go there and they see what is actually happening. So what I learned in the morning from the education partner, I come here and see how is it getting applied. Right? Oh, this is the way they're using the biofermenter. You actually get to see the industrial biofermenter. And the scientists who are working there in Biocon, who have many years of experience there, actually uses their time to teach these students. And it's not just one batch we are talking about. So that is also a part of the corporate social responsibility. Biocon is giving back to the society by ensuring that the scientists who are working there are always spending little time with the students, teaching them and passing on that knowledge that they have accumulated over these years. Right? So that is what happens in the functional visit. Now, this is the hands-on training part, right? In the hands-on training part, we are partnered with Narayan Hidalya, Thermo Fisher, and the BioZ, where depending on each course, right? Doesn't mean you join any course in Biocon Academy, you will go to all of them, or they all will be your education partner. These education partners and the hands-on training partners will depend on each course, right? So in functional visit, when you go there, you're not touching anything because it's a GMP area in Biocon. You're not employees of Biocon. You're students of Biocon. When you go there, you can't touch and do anything over there. So that is why we have done hands-on training with Biozin, Thermo Fisher, and that area to get hands-on experience. You do something with your hands. You see the techniques that are being used. You see the instruments that are being used in Thermo Fisher. You see the fermenters that are being developed in Biozin. How do they all work? There you get to touch and do things over there. So that is also very important. So that is the third part of our model, which is the hands-on training. So recently I had read that if you have, uh, you know, 25% of the technical knowledge, it's enough. You can still learn. But 75% belongs to the soft skills. Now, what are soft skills? How do you communicate? How do you present yourself? Right? How do you, uh, you know, uh, mix and work well within a team? How do you attend an interview? In an interview, you get only about five to 10 minutes to uh, when the person makes a decision. Does that, is that a measure of your knowledge? No. In that 10 minutes, how are you able to impress the person who's sitting opposite you with your knowledge, with your positive attitude, and with your communication skills? Everything matters. The way you dress, the way you speak, the language that you use, right? Everything matters. So that is the soft skill training part. And we do take care of that too, that, that to make the students who come in there to be more confident and ready to get into the industry. We talk about team building, we talk about presentation skills, we teach you time management, because once you get into the industry, so many projects come in together to you at the same time. What do I do? How do I prioritize, right? How do I manage all this? So there are tips and tricks to do that, and we teach you that, even writing a proper email, it gives you a first impression. You're writing a mail to your boss. Boss decides, oh, this guy doesn't even know to write an email, right? So we teach you that too. 
So we have an external company who participates with us in that. We also have an internal communication coach. So uh, the person, uh, she works, the internal communication coach of Biocon Academy, ensures that daily there is touch points with the students. And every time if there are any weaker students who need little more help in the communication, she personally spends time with them to ensure. So every student, we have finished 16 batches and we are now going to launch our 17th batch in the uh, KGI, with KGI in the biosciences area. I have seen every student have become definitely better within the four months. So I've been in the field of education for 25 years. I always feel for a person to improve their soft skill, it requires more time, right? But here I've seen this change happening. And that is because whatever you're learning, you get to apply it. If you're learning presentation skills, you have to do so many presentations throughout this course that constantly you're improving. I'm improving my body language, I'm improving my eye movement, I'm improving my speech. So I get to practice it and practice makes a man perfect. That is why these students, once they finish the course in the academy, they are much more confident and can speak really well. This is the model which we apply to all our programs. And changing the client. Okay. Now, pedagogy. What does pedagogy mean? It means the methods that you use for teaching, right? So, why are we so different? What is it that we use in our teaching? So it is a proactive learning model. What does that mean? So when students, we normally when we go to any college or school, what do we tend to do? We just go and sit there. Then the teacher comes there and starts teaching. Some interested students really write down notes, focus. Some students are just sitting, oh, and then this uh, go, I have to go and play this game now, I have to do that thing now, there's no focus, right? This is a proactive model where you have to come prepared, right? The class begins with a quiz. So they would have given you reading material, which you need to read and come, and then there is a quiz. So that way you are coming prepared into a class, and then there is a discussion, right? You learn a lot from your peers also. It's not just the teacher who's teaching you. All the students who are there, they come with varied experience and varied degrees. They also come with knowledge. So peer-to-peer -peer learning is also an important part of it. So you come prepared and you need to stay active in the class. There is marks for interactivity. If you ask questions, there is marks for that also, right? And there's also project-based learning. So throughout the course, we have a project which you keep contributing on. Every time you're reading a subject, you need to work on that project too. And at the end of the entire course, you're submitting your project. So every time you're learning, you're able to apply it onto a project. Case studies. Case studies is a very important tool because uh, the industry brings in cases and says, okay, this is the area that we faced a problem. If you come across such a problem, how will you do it? And that makes us think, right? And that makes us contribute better and apply our knowledge better. So we do a lot of this. Most of our learning is very interactive and it is where you get to apply things. Okay. okay, I think I pressed it too fast. I need everything to move fast. So. Okay, so now to tell you a little bit about the program that we uh, are doing in Biocon Academy. So in 2014, we had started it off with the Biocon KGI certificate program in biosciences, uh, and we have finished 16 batches of that program. And the success is that 100% uh, placement record across all uh, 15 batches and the batch 15 placement is still going on. 
right? So that's the important thing which attracts students to us because we are able to place all these students in different industries. So we have lots of companies coming to us to recruit these students. And why do they come to us and not go to colleges and recruit? Uh, is because these students already have the industry school. So the amount of time a company like BRL or Intas has to put on these students become less. It's not that they don't have to train these students at all because it's a four-month certificate program. And uh, you know there is much more to learn than that, right? But it becomes easier for them to teach because you already have some level of knowledge. Then we need to only train you into the next level. And in 2015, we launched the Applied Industrial Microbiology program with uh, BITS Pilani. And uh, here also the model remains the same. Uh, and the BITS faculty actually teach from different campuses. It could be, they could be in Hyderabad, Pilani, Goa, and they teach from there. Uh, then we launched one for the managers of Biocon, which is the Bioscience Management Program. And we are now trying to convert that to a full-fledged MBA program. That will be our biggest program because we are focusing only on small-term certificate program. But this will be for working people who have around six or seven years of experience and want to move on to the next level and gain much more knowledge. We are planning to launch an MBA. Uh, due to the COVID situation, we couldn't do it. Otherwise, by now, the MBA program will have started. Then we, in, we launch another program in the area of clinical development. So what we do is we look into what is the industry asking for? What are the skills that is required for the industry? What are they saying they're not getting in the market? Then we focus on that particular uh, area and we develop a course in that area. So the faculties who have joined into this uh, webinar, we also have a faculty development program, which is for two weeks duration. Naturally, you can't come for a four month course uh, and so on. But uh, if this is a two week duration. We try to keep it somewhere around June, July when we have the vacation. You can come in and in this program. And here, all the fact, all the scientists of Biocon actually come and teach you in the morning and then take you into the industry and show you what is happening in the industry. This, hel this helps you to get an idea about the industry. It also helps you to guide your students better, to teach them better, to help them at least understand which department would they should be working for, right? So this is uh, every year we have this program. But as a KGI program, we launch three batches in a year. But the faculty development program, the CDP program, and the AIM program, we do one batch in a year. If you go into the Biocon Academy website, you will see the dates of the when the batches are going to get launched. Then uh, our latest program was in the area of quality control analytical with uh, Ramaya College. And uh, one batch is over, and we are ready to launch the next batch as soon as this COVID situation slightly settles. We are supposed to start in August. We might have to delay it a bit, but we definitely plan to launch that. The other areas that now we are looking into is global regulatory. And I also told you about the MBA in biotechnology. We are looking at integrated drug discovery for Syngene. Uh, Syngene is, in the, is a clinical research organization. So we are looking for training uh, the freshers in that area. So Syngene wants to absorb those people. And Syngene is also looking for their current employees to go through this training. We are looking into a quality refresher program for Biocon junior employees. And we are also looking for a technical writing program for Syngene. So we help these Biocon group of, of companies also to train their employees in small ways. Like I said, Biocon is a CSR initiative. Biocon Academy is a CSR initiative of Biocon. And I said, we place the students across different industries. These are a list of some of the industries that we have placed our students. We couldn't fit in more here. But every, every batch that we do, we increase. The numbers keep increasing of the companies who hire someone. You look into any of the top biopharma companies, they are over here. We also have startup biotech companies taking our students. And if you're interested in knowing which departments do these students get placed in, most of the students go into production, R&D, and if you take the whole of quality, I have split it into quality uh, assurance, quality control, and quality control microbiology. But if you take those, for three areas, 64 plus 64 plus 54. So that is the biggest area. Quality is the biggest area where our students get placed. And then comes production and R&D. And then the other departments. So it's very interesting to see how the students want to get into uh, different areas like corporate communications, 
project management. Uh, and that's also not bad, right? You don't have to be the technical expert alone, but if you have great communication skills and uh, corporate communication is the area that you want to work in, having added biotechnology knowledge or a biopharma knowledge is always required when you get into such roles, right? So if I know chemistry, I have done my first graduation in chemistry, and then uh, when we talk about any chemistry related courses, I will be able to pitch it. So that way, if I'm in HR or if I'm in the finance or if I am in uh, medical writing, any of these areas, the knowledge of your industry definitely helps you to contribute much more. So our students go into those areas also. We've seen many people go into the marketing area too. They are interested in that area. So it always depends on what is your passion, what is your interest, right? Not what is happening over there. So, okay, uh, R&D roles are there, let me join R&D. Oh, quality roles are there, let me join quality. So where is your strength line? What is it that you want to do? They say, if you have the passion, you never feel that you're getting into work. If you have the passion, your Monday mornings and your Friday evenings are the same, you're excited about it anyway, right? They always say Monday morning blues and Friday evening people are generally happy. But if you are really passionate about your job, it doesn't matter. You will love to come into work and contribute so much. So passion matters. And uh, this is where you can uh, find our details. You, if you have any queries, you could call us at that number. And we are located in the Electronic City Phase 2. In our Biocon Academy website, we have uh, you know all the details of all the programs. What are the content being taught there? And uh, who are the faculties of these programs? All details you'll find, plus the fees. I'm sure you're thinking about the fees also. The fees varies for different programs. So if it is a AGI program, it's pretty expensive because it is a US-based uh, program. And uh, if it is an Indian program, then the fees is uh, lesser. So you can look at our program uh, rates and everything is available on the website. Uh, I want you to leave you with uh, a few thoughts. Uh, you know, uh, it's not enough, like I said, if you just have the degrees and the education, a few things that the companies are now looking for, and the foremost one is innovation, right? So if you keep doing the same thing, you're not going to survive for a long time. You should be ready to be flexible. You should always innovate. You should think what can be done. There are a lot of uh, startup companies which have come in, or big companies, if you can learn their history and how did they start, even when you're taking at the KFC or the Madurai Eye Hospital, how did they all start? Right? You don't need to have lots of money and lots of uh, uh, knowledge just to do something small. You can start in a small way. If you have a great idea and you think it's going to work out. If you see the Royal Enfield uh, bullet that you have, you go to Punjab, they actually converted into kind of a tractor that can be used. Right? So people are really innovative. And in Punjab, they also use the washing machine to turn the lassi because lassi is something which everybody drinks there and you need low. So they use the washing machine, which goes in speed and uh, makes a lot of that innovation. People, all of you have a bond with that. So focus on thinking more and getting your ideas out there and seeing what else can you do. Especially in this current COVID situation, when different markets are not able to pop up, you need to innovate. You can't just say, I am in this, now my job is gone, what do I do? I just sit and wait for the situation to get better? No, think what is required now. Which companies are doing better now? Zoom, right? Zoom suddenly picked up so much. The person who owns Zoom has become multimillionaire now, just with this space, right? And if at this time you're launching some tool that is useful for this, uh, like the WebEx that we're doing, if it is useful for these technology uh, teaching online, it will be a big seller, right? So if you're in the IT area and your job is getting impacted, you could think of developing something like this. There are so many small, small things that you can do and keep changing, keep learning, keep learning, right? So innovation, learning, and networking, it's very important, very, very important that you connect with people. Say, suppose one of my team members wants to go to US and uh, do some project there, you know, or learn something there. And she's not got an opportunity to go there. But she has told me many times, that, you know, if I get an opportunity to go to US, it would have been so wonderful. And she's told many of her friends too. She's told many of her dad's friends too. She's told everybody that she really wants to go to US and do this. 
So what happens is that if someone comes to me, one of my friends comes to me and says, you know, there's an opportunity which has come up in US. You're thinking of hiring somebody. Do you know of someone? That will strike me. Oh, yes. My team member had told me about it and I'll try and connect that. So networking is important. Stay in touch with the right kind of people. Have mentors, right? Look at the person who can really help you and always seek guidance from them. Always be in touch with them. The people who have so many years of experience can be real good mentors for you because they have struggled and reached there, right? It's not been an easy way for anyone. So they have gone through so much and that experience you will not get anywhere in any of the books or in the Google site. So you need to have mentors. You need to listen to their feedback. You need to be open in networking. Not just be on Facebooks and Instagram, be in LinkedIn also. You have to become a professional. Okay? So now I look at if you have any questions, I could look into the chat for any questions. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for a nice presentation. Uh, participants have some two questions, madam. Okay. Uh, one is, uh, since students cannot develop their hands-on skills labs in the labs right now in COVID situation, what kind of online courses would you suggest which would help in industry labs? Okay. So uh, this uh, COVID situation is a pretty bad situation as we are not able to launch our courses also. But the method that we are trying uh, is uh, like if you take Biozine, for example, they are into bioformenter training they will also be starting their programs with lesser number of people. So it's uh, if you still take all the precautions of wearing your mask and sanitizing. Uh, and one, madam, uh, thank you one, very much. And one second, Umesh, I'm not finished it yet. Oh, sorry, sir. No problem. So uh, there are companies which are running these programs still, and there are a lot of online programs like- I was told in the morning. So here you could see briefly, I'll take you. So I am not going to tell all those micro, biochemistry, food technology, genetics, environment, plant, animal, IPR, bioinformatics. And you could see biotechnology in India in 1978, first biotech company, Biocon. And we are lucky that we are with no, uh, Biocon Academy. And you could see that uh, Kiran Majinda Shah Madam started with uh, the company in 19 and now it has a, one of the major bio industry in the world. Then in 1981, we have CCMB in Hyderabad. Then Lalji Singh, who pioneered the Indian DNA fingerprinting. Then in 1986, Department of Biotechnology. Why I am emphasizing this, 1986 Department of Biotechnology. So we should be grateful, blessed enough that government of India, not only India, Pan world, they have a separate unit called Department of Biotechnology. In Karnataka, we have IT and BT. So therefore, we shouldn't be you know, uh, like, uh, no, biotech this, biotech that. We should be very focused. And since then, gradual, regular process has been made the field. And we should be technically sound to uphold the purpose of the biotech inception. And what is the significance? As you could see, biotech industry has grown threefold in the last five years. Industry has increased spending in R&D and attracts FDI, drugs, pharma, biotech uh, industries ranked third in Asia Pacific region. After Japan and Korea, there is budget relocation, allocation and improvement in the skilled manpower infrastructure and contribution to the improvement of agricultural sector. Now you could see we are world is reeling with Corona endemic or pandemic, what we are seeing it. What we are dependent on? The drugs. If drugs comes from the biotech industry or the pharma industry, I think it makes a multi, multi billion or trillion dollar, no? The, the business. So therefore, you could see not only it helps support the agri and human or health, it also supports the life. So humanity on the top priority. Then we have the Birex, then DBT, then bi uh, no, biotech industry partnership programs, industry in introduction of biotech bill in the parliament and setting up the regulatory authority to oversee the progress and so many things to carry out the risk assessment of all the biotech products because we have to look even the ethical parts also. Then the issue areas, as you could see, multiple regulatory bodies, funding constraints, lack of infrastructure. So to overcome this, what we have to think of a joint venture where all of us 
joined together in a single platform not like that a small small organization and doing individually and don't land up instead of we can think of multidisciplinary interdisciplinary approach to overcome all those so if you see the great organizations like japan and all if you could see no i'll just put one a simple example from hebal till yelanka that entire set is one set of industry so one process one thing then another goes like that no and it is a collective effort so we should think in that way then biotech at pu chandigarh and all those things so you could see dbt dst ugc icmr csir and the current courses what is most important for the present generation they should understand that normal this bsc courses or msc courses or btech courses or no if you forget anything just a bsc and msc will land up or make you land up in a highly paid salaried jobs so for that briefly i'll take you a few slides uh, teaching research pharma food processing bioprocess agriculture setting up own project so this is entrepreneurship skill you develop well so these are the job opportunities no which i'll take you like applications are in medical therapeutics agriculture environment animal industry so you could see these are the no uh, multiple things where you can look into so now as uh, no briefly for few minutes i'll take you to uh, the part which i'd like to really focus on is uh, i think yeah so you could see here a thought to start with charles darwin the origin of species and you know, you know that we are looking into that survival of the fittest our eminent industrialist ratan tata has clearly told this year we are not supposed to look into profit and loss what we are supposed to look into survival survival of the fittest so therefore it is not the strongest of the species that survives not the most intelligent but the one most responsive to change so change we should be flexible we shouldn't be rigid and our indian tradition has clearly mentioned how flexible we were there are pros and cons that you no know, for flexibility but we shouldn't forget our roots so charles darwin the origin of species so can you sense the change here so what we will take you is the emerging world world is going through a major change either through environment through lifestyle through health everything else resulting in a borderless world where seven eyes are free flowing what are the seven eyes investment industries information ideas innovations and individuals and what is the seven point these individuals shouldn't think of individual gain they should think of a collective way that is called compassionate empathetic and humbleness and you could see the types of academic courses which india runs with so these are the job based course where you could see and as we are speaking about biotechnology and i being into this sector for more than 20 years i could tell you that you no know, many of my friends after doing biotechnology research and all they have joined into it companies and other you no know, companies or shifted but i personally tell you that i quote my own example stick to your field you will success one day it's like a mango plant you plant for a day you can't expect immediately within 6 months or 1 year you have to wait for 5 years to get you no know, the nice dividends so here you could see we are telling about research based courses so biotech comes under this research based courses where you have bsc msc btech and all those life sciences and immediate jobs are very less that you should understand clearly phd or minimum pg is compulsory for better career scope so i'd like to focus here that immediate job after 3 4 years in other courses but here you have to minimum do pg and pursue phd why it requires highly rated ranked premier institute for better job opportunities and biocon want to be you no know, one of the academy which supports wipro biocon and so and so forth the bits pilani iits everywhere you could see iiscrs are there they have their biotech units 
So for better job opportunities, since it requires highly sophisticated lab facilities and highly qualified faculties. So therefore, biotech is not like that. Oh, overnight, you can open and you can run the show. And you could see this is the hierarchy. So affiliated college, private, autonomous, state government, central universities, JNU, JNU conducts all over India biotech courses, BHU, Punjab University, central universities, premier institutes are there, as I have told you, IITs, NIT, and IIS, and research concepts. So we have to reach here, the second in the rank or the second pyramid, second from the top, because once we land up here, then we can think of going ahead. And these are the organizations which help you in your studies for either JRF or SRF and to do hardcore research. So these are the educational institute. From there, you have to raise your bar or raise your level to research concepts. And this is what individual autonomous research organizations, IAC, TAFIR, NCBS, and JSIR, and all we should be proud enough that they are in Bangalore. So hierarchy continued. So here you could see as we go in this hierarchy, education is free, funded, get monthly stipend with better facilities and career scope, which I'd like to emphasize that you should think of stipend and pursuing your higher studies and lots of stipends are there, which runs more than 25,000 per month, which by just doing your three years course and running into the job, which Bangalore, no, many of the organizations, KPO, BPO and all those sectors, I will suggest you that as you are biotech students, Please focus on those fields. As we work hard, we get better institutions, hence facilities and faculties, and thus better opportunities, and we decide our future. So jobs in biotech, India needs more than 30 lakh PhDs by 2025, and more than 1.5 lakh research scholars as we open up our economy and aspire for super power status. And why super power? It's going very really apt if you could see. Now, 2020, we are now, no, just a few years back, if we see India was never considered to be a powerful country. Now you could see US, Russia, France, everyone is supporting not only by difference in to the terms of research and all those. And for that, what we should do, we should pursue quality PhD research scholars who are emphasizing to empower India indigenously and going with our prime minister stating that indigenous making India. Dow PhD is the minimum decent qualification in biology if you plan for your long-term profession. Still, there are limited growing opportunities. As I have been clearly telling you, I give my option or I give my a simple motto to all my dear students and to, in fact, all the participants, five years versus 50 years. Five years what? Three years of UG, two years of PG, and after that, you write a decent entrance exam and get into the scholarship stipend and your life is settled for 50 years. And if you think of enjoying those initial five years, then I don't have to say anything else. You can understand. So what are they? Let's explore them. So these are the, no, I need not, it is a self-explanatory. You could see no, who tells that biotech doesn't have government sector jobs. You have private sector, R&D, manufacturing, marketing. And second, you could see government sector jobs, non-fellowship uh, refresher and fellowship best, academic jobs, higher education research, and non-core and other jobs. So private industries, as you could see, all pharma, BT companies, Biocon, Dr. Reddy's, huge investment in chemical instruments and other lab, lesser manpower are required. So you require skill. A simple, again, I'll tell you, one of the student who just pursued MSc in bioinstrumentation and runs a premier elect no, electron microscope center in Jal Jalma, that is ICMR Institute. And you'll be wondering to know his salary, it's more than two lakhs. Because even the expert he has undergone, he is like, no, the electron man has been told in ICMR Jalma, that is in power. Pay for premier central top rated private institute for fresher recruitments. So who tells that freshers are not being recruited? Only thing is that as Biocon Academy Bindu Madam has clearly told, you should have feather on your caps. Not like just you are doing UG coming to college like a general other course. Biotech, you should understand, it's a professional technical course. You should keep adding feather to your cap. So better job facilities and better skilled candidates. And small companies, medium, big, and multinational companies are there. And we should be proud that India has got one of the international unit, if you remember, uh, no, uh, that is called ICGB, 
international center for uh, no, uh, biotechnology, which is in Delhi. One is in uh, uh, South Africa and is one in Italy. And these are the private sector. So no, this is self, I need not to keep on explaining you. Only I am telling about the skill need, limited, moderate, technical, r and huge investment in lab infrastructure. So you could see experience of two campus placement or backdoor entry, which is reference which you have to omit completely because always it should be your first choice for most job seekers should be your enhanced skill, professional skills. Then the first focus should be on the top, no, bottom. So bottom is marketing manufacturing and r d now you decide where you want to be you want to be in marketing you want to be in manufacturing you want to be r d and i see that most of my students after their msc and research they have landed either in mylan lab or in uh, no uh, if i am not wrong Teva pharmaceuticals bharat biotech they are all just by doing bsc biotech msc biotech with advanced skill they are there so you should understand that private sector educational system and so you could see uh, that government sector jobs yes which briefly i would like to tell you research based job did not mean phd but it may or may not accompany phd so research based as i have told you one of the, the scientists in jalma he has after doing msc is into electron microscope center so there are fellowships through which i was about to show you you could see fellowship based fresher research programs CSIR, ICMR, ICAR, GATE, first class pass in science or engineering after MSc. So if what you could see, less competition, merit is honored. So highest pay scale initially, 16,000, 19,000 out of fresher 22, 24. I tell you that just after doing other courses, who will give you after five years this? So therefore, we have to blend as, no, there was a talk that MBA biotechnology, yes, because that is required because we should understand a commerce mba graduate can't you know, lead a biopharma industry because their technical part will be of commerce background we should think of r d as i have shown in my earlier slide first is marketing manufacturing and then top r d so the government the more opportunity in central and labs and all those and you could see we get the circulate minimum 300 fresher research jobs every month across india only from government sector at biotechnologies2020.com so you can go through this website which will help you to understand that how much you stand being a biotechnologist and as you could see here academic jobs phd eligibility you could see here 10 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 so the total you spend around 12 uh, plus 13 14 15 16 17 years then these are the gate fellowships stipends you could see here and sample in number all india ranking you could see csir ugc net so where you are landing csir labs so academic teaching jobs lectures with net are eligible for a limited stipend whereas as i have shown you in my earlier slide with phd or into that after bsc and msc you land up with 24 25000 under no different scheme icmr than all those programs so higher education and research as biology is predominantly a research subject having a phd or minimum a phd is must for better scope and i just complete with this you could see these are no or uh, just wanted to show you that more than 70 percent btech student like basic sciences like genetics molecular and all those are better job and this is the call for the day or call for the time that during this covid 19 has made us learn that how important our life science courses are so with this i just uh, conclude uh, no, uh, that my talk stating that this biotech is far more better but as bindu madam has clearly stated that short training and certificate programs will be the feather on your cap thank you thank you so much thank you dr shantanu for making a wonderful talk within 10 minutes and uh, you gave a very good overview on scope for biotech research and also job opportunities. Thank you very much. Now I request uh, Dr. Ramya Madam to uh, give a talk on opportunities for research. Madam is basically a biotechnology expert. She has done PhD in biotechnology. Uh, 
we have two dynamic uh, principals uh, uh, for today's webinar dr chakuntala samelson and dr ramya madam whom i know for more than 10 years we have organized many programs in association with them today uh, ramya madam will be giving a talk on opportunities for research in biotechnology over to you madam thank you sir um a warm welcome uh, dr m uh, ramesh chief executive officer ksta dr ss ishwaran academic dean biocon academy bengaluru uh, thank you thank you so much for coming up with uh, such an amazing platform uh, webinar a need of an hour for our students as of now uh, dr sn venkatesh principal seshadripuram first grade college uh, professor shantanu um secretary north bangalore science forum and head department of biotechnology seshadripuram college dr shakuntala samilson principal surana college south end for and shri b g umesh scientific officer ksta for uh, coordinating such a lovely uh, event um and i am so very happy to look at the participation number that's 175 so i am very glad that there are so many students out there Uh, with all this pandemic and uh, uncertainty of what is what's next uh, they have been enrolled for this uh, platform and looking forward that probably there is a few of us who are out there for them uh, probably guiding us through this particular pandemic situation and hopefully seeing to it that their futures are being well secured um thank you so much just give me a minute i will just share my uh, content I hope I'm audible. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yes. Thank you. um just to give a minute sir i'm able i'm not able to connect to my desktop yes ma'am now connected yeah yeah just give me a minute sir give a brief overview of his uh, expertise ankur is working as general manager process development at bicon r&d he has more than 18 years of experience in developing and scaling up processes using mammalian and microbial platform ankur has extensive experience in leading teams setting labs and pilot uh, plants technology transfer and was integral member of teams involved in getting important product approvals for icon in various regions like us and europe etc ankur has masters in biochemical engineering and biotechnology from the most prestigious university in delhi and he has an executive mba from after great institutes i am ankur he has served as advisory board member of school of biological sciences society delhi ankur has won great manager award conducted by economic times and people uh, people business in 2017 in the overall management category across industry this uh, introduction let me welcome dr ankur patnagar for this uh, webinar uh, he will be giving a talk on an overview of development of a biological drug over to you dr ankur thank you thank you sir for the kind introduction Uh, am i audible 
Ah, yeah, please. Okay. Yes, sir. I will uh, try to share the screen. Screen also visible. Is the presentation visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very okay, much, sir. thank you. So I would like to uh, start by thanking all the dignitaries for this uh, opportunity and uh, you know very nice talks. They were very informative. I have been listening to all the talks till now, and uh, so thank want to thank you for all the audience. And uh, so the topic for uh, my presentation is an overview of uh, development for uh, biologics. So just setting the uh, expectation uh, for the talk. So you know, developing a biological drug uh, generally takes between you know eight, ten years to twenty years, and uh, we have around uh, less than one hour to be able to cover the process for uh, developing a biologic uh, drug. So what we will do today is uh, try to have an overview, try to see you know most of the important points which uh, you know have to be. Uh, you know, paid attention to while developing a drug. And then, you know, uh, I think uh, you will realize that what we were hearing in the previous talks, you know, different skill set is required. And, and throughout the presentation, you will realize how different skill set are required to be able to make a drug from the discovery and uh, to the market. I will start by uh, saying that drug development is generally there are two main arms for it. One arm is called as the CMC. Uh, the full form is chemistry, manufacturing and control. So the CMC arm uh, is actually about making the product. So it's about identifying the molecule, discovering the molecule, making a process to make that drug. How do we scale up to a manufacturing scale? How do we make sure that we can uh, consistently make the drug, uh, you know, uh, batch after batch. We have to get approval from the regulatory agencies, and then we get inspections, we get audits. So all that is the part of CMC. The other parallel track which goes on, you know, along with this uh, CMC development is the clinical. So the different stages of clinical is that the drug is tested in in animals first to find its toxicity, then in in some uh, uh, patients first a limited number of patients where we study the the amount of dosage which is required then the set of patients become more so we have phase one phase two phase three and all this data from the clinical side and from the cmc side is submitted as a final package uh, which leads to an approval for a for a drug so for today's presentation we will be focusing on the cmc part that is where uh, the process development uh, comes in. So these are the high level uh, you know, steps in developing a biologics drug. So uh, first step is identify the product. You know, like in any industry, you have to first find out the product that you're trying to make. And then once you identify the product, you have to find a good machine which can be used to make that product. Find a machine, you have to develop an entire process to make uh, the product. Then the process is first made in the lab scale or in the pilot scale. And then finally, this process has, go, has to go into a manufacturing stage. Then you have to develop a lot of testing tools to monitor whether the product that you are making is, is right or not. Then you have to establish a shelf life for this product, you know, which is important for our drugs. So all the drugs have certain, uh, you know, expiry. And then finally, all this goes into, you know, a, a package where we get approval for making this uh, product for the patients. So I will try to cover all these, uh, you know, steps. The first step is identify the product. So uh, this slide talks about and gives you an idea about the uh, the complexity which is uh, you know along with these uh, biologics molecules so if you see on the uh, on the left hand side of this graph is aspirin uh, which is a chemical molecule and then we have uh, proteins like insulin erythropoietin and then finally monoclonal antibodies and uh, the the numbers that you see are actually their approximate uh, molecular weight in, in uh, daltons 
so you can see that you know the complexity just because the size of the molecules is much bigger goes higher as we go to more and more complicated uh, biologics molecules so today uh, what i will be focusing on is more of a you know a monoclonal antibody as as a product so just to again uh, show some comparison between the the other pharmaceutical which is more uh, chemistry based and the biologics so the the biggest difference is in the size the other big difference is that uh, they are made using chemical synthesis and all the biologic products are used may, may uh, used making uh, the living cells usually the small molecules pharmaceutical products are given orally uh, but these biologics cannot sustain the harsh environment of the uh, of the stomach so they have to be injected or they have to be infused this uh, the small molecules you can get through retail uh, retail pharmacies but these complicated biologics are only available uh, with the doctors or with the hospitals so there is an example you know below which is a lipitor and and uh, herceptin as a molecule so uh, while choosing the product and uh, as we decided to have uh, monoclonal antibody as as a product so monoclonal antibody can work in by various mechanisms and as we identify the disease we have to identify the mechanism by which this disease works and then identify a molecule which can help us in blocking that mechanism so on the slide you can see in the uh, orange blocks uh, they are all different mechanisms by which a monoclonal antibody can actually work against a disease. It can be blocking, so these antibodies can glow, go and block, and that is how they prevent certain uh, you know, uh, reaction inside the body to happen. So this is uh, some example for that is, uh, you know, for people who have uh, studied immunology, uh, say uh, anti-TNF alpha, there are a lot of cytokines which actually play a very important role in the autoimmune diseases. So if you, if you have autoimmune diseases and if you want to block the chain reaction for the autoimmune diseases, you can have an antibody which can go and block these, some of these cytokines. So that is how it works and it slows down the, the progression of the disease. It can be through ADCC. This is antibody dependent uh, cell mediated uh, cytotoxicity. It can be by targeting. So the antibodies are known to be very specific for their targets. So we can attach a toxin or we can uh, attach a, a toxic molecule to that antibody. And the antibody makes sure that it goes to the right target and binds uh, to the right target. So this helps in uh, reducing the side effects, uh, which are generally associated with other uh, toxic therapies like uh, you know, chemotherapy. So the idea of this slide is that once you have decided the disease that you want to work on and then by understanding the mechanism, we have to develop a molecule which will you know, prevent the progression of that uh, disease. So uh, this is a little more detail about the uh, structure of an antibody. The left hand side, like you know, all proteins have form and function. So they have some structure and they have some function uh, which is attached to that, uh, related to that function. So on the left-hand side of the diagram, you can see the biological characteristics. So this is, uh, you know, the biological characteristics of an antibody, which defines how does this antibody work? So there's an antigen binding site, there is an effector function site, which is the FC portion of the antibody. So this helps in, uh, you know, the ADCC uh, mechanism for the antibody to, to work. The antigen binding sites make sure that the uh, antibody goes and binds directly to the right uh, you know, spot where we want it to bind. So these are the biological characteristics. On the right hand side, you see the, the structure of the molecule. So this is, you know, like all proteins, this is made up of amino acids. So we, we can have a lot of heterogeneity in that. There are places where disulfide bonds are formed. There are places where uh, glycosylation can happen. Uh, there can be some fragmentation which uh, can happen like at the hinge region. 
uh, one light chain can can get cut off one heavy chain can get cut off uh, there can be some aggregation which can happen so there's some antibodies uh, molecules which can aggregate so all these are the different physiochemical properties uh, of of an antibody so together like any protein the biological characteristics and the physiochemical characteristics play a very important role in making sure how does that antibody work and how safe is that antibody so once we have identified uh, you know the product that we want to make the next thing is we have to choose the the machine to make the product and you know the interesting thing for uh, these biologics is that uh, scientists have not been able to make uh, you know machines which can make these complicated uh, you know uh, biologics molecules so we have to use some living cells to be able to make these uh, products so we'll see the examples in the next slide so some examples are we can use bacteria to make uh, certain products so generally more simpler products proteins like uh, streptokinase uh, we use bacteria we can use yeast so uh, yeast can be used to make a little more complicated uh, uh, product so we use yeast to make uh, insulins for example and then the last is mammalian cells so the cells which are very similar to what we have in our body and we need uh, mammalian cells kind of uh, you know cells as machines to be able to make these complicated uh, monoclonal antibodies so again uh, you know a reason why uh, we have different different uh, machines for different products so uh, the best glycosylation which can happen which is very similar to the body our body is comes from the mammalian cells the bacterial cells cannot do glycosylation yeast cells they give a hyper mannose uh, you know which can be immunogenic uh, to patients the insects and the plants also have a different type of uh, glycosylation so the best fit uh, to make a monoclonal antibody is uh, using the mammalian uh, cells so uh, a lot of textbook about uh, you know procedures or the methodology to make uh, monoclonal antibodies which is like we immunize a, a rat or a mouse and then we you know use that uh, to create monoclonal antibody so this is not the way uh, we make it at an industrial scale this is still used to, for working on a smaller scale but for industrial scale uh, now we use the recombinant dna technology so we have certain mammalian cell lines and then we uh, you know insert the dna of the uh, molecule that we want to, or sorry the gene of the molecule that we want to make and once we do that we get several clones which will have the gene inserted and from that we have to do and select the best uh, clone and once we get the best clone uh, which has the right uh, gene inserted at the right place we have to preserve this because this is the most important uh, you know part for making a product uh, so we we freeze it we freeze it and we you know call it as a master cell bank as a working cell bank or a research cell bank for mammalian cells there are many cell lines which are available uh, which are commonly used uh, the most commonly used is a cho cell line uh, which is which comes from the chinese hamster ovary cells so you know 70 80% of the industrial uh, antibody products are made using uh, cho cell line there are other cell lines also which are uh, ns0 sp20 cell lines which come from a murine origin they are also uh, used for many uh, antibodies few other cell lines like uh, baby hamster kidney cell line vero cell line and there have been some human cell lines also which uh, are available but they are not very widely used because uh, you know the, the risk of uh, human virus uh, coming from those cell lines so like i said most of the industrial processes use uh, cho uh, cell line so uh, we have uh, discussed how do we identify the product we have discussed after the product how do we identify the machine 
and then we come to the next stages once we have the product and we have these uh, living cells we have to develop a process to make the product so the process to make uh, you know these products at industrial scale there are three main process steps the first step is called upstream where we use a bioreactor so this is the stage where we actually use the living cells to make the product inside the bioreactor the second stage is called downstream which is the purification stage so once the product is made the job for the cells is done we have to remove the cells and then this when the cells are there they will also make a lot of other you know uh, things they will make their own proteins they will have their own dna some cells will die so they will release their intracellular uh, material so there will be a lot of other things also along with the product so the second st uh, step is the purification step where we use different chromatography and uh, filtration to be able to make purify the product the third stage uh, is the formulation stage so this is the stage where we get the purified product and then we have to make sure this purified uh, product converts into a product a drug product which can be you know given in a market which can have a shelf life uh, for you know an x amount of of years so these are the three process steps which get repeated each time when we have to make the product upstream make the product downstream purify the product formulation formulate the drug product when all these steps are going on uh, there are a lot of uh, quality controls in, in in between there are quality assurance teams there are manufacturing teams so safety teams maintenance teams all of them get involved in making sure that these processes you know, run uh, you know, smoothly so before we go into a little more detail about each of these uh, process steps i just wanted to give an idea about you know the product that we are making are not simple products they are highly complicated and uh, like i showed in in one of the earlier slide that they have both a form and a function so they can have different masses they can have aggregates fragments different type of uh, charge because uh, the there are a lot of charged amino acids they can have differences in glycosylation so you need tools to be able to monitor each and every product quality attribute and we have to have a very tight control on each and every product quality attribute for the product that we are making so during the whole development during the whole manufacturing we have to keep on building testing of the product uh, especially in the development to make sure that we have a, we are making a process to make a good product which is safe and which is efficacious so this uh, picture uh, this slide uh, shows certain quality attributes uh, that we use we measure charge we measure differences in size fragments aggregates and all the protein uh, analysis techniques that uh, you all uh, would be reading in your uh, uh, syllabus we actually use them hplcs mass spec uh, capillary electrophoresis everything every technology is used to be able to monitor some or the other product quality attribute and generally not one te technique is used uh, you know we always have uh, two or three orthogonal techniques so if you are measuring size with one we also have another orthogonal technique to be able to uh, you know verify the the charge distribution that we we have so you, we have uh, circular uh, dichroism uh, so all these are different uh, techniques which are used so we go to the next slide so like i said uh, you know different techniques so we have to understand the primary structure we have to understand the secondary structure and you can see on the uh, on the third row uh, sorry the third column of the table are different techniques which we all read in our in our curriculum in our uh, academics all of them are practically used to understand the prime from primary to the tertiary to quarterly structure of uh, these antibodies i also mentioned uh, earlier that we also have to uh, monitor the effector function the the functionality of the antibody how strongly it is binding is it binding to the right 
target is it you know uh, it is is it creating the effect which it is supposed to do and this can be done through many functions uh, and you can see we have to study a lot of bindings to different different receptors of an antibody and then compare it with some standard and find out whether you know the behavior of this antibody all this is done in vitro we have to develop assays uh, to in vitro keep a check of the performance of the antibody throughout the development and throughout the manu uh, manufacturing so uh, now this is a, a process flow which generally typically gets gets used and you can see uh, on the top side are the bioreactors so uh, we start with a vial uh, where the cells are frozen they are kept frozen and whenever we want to run, make a product we take out these frozen vials then we have to expand the cells because you know we have to run a, a large bioreactor so you need a lot of cells to be able to inoculate a large bioreactor so we have a, a, a scale up stage uh, for all these cells once we reach the main production bioreactor then we run the process there once the process is over we go to the different step, steps of uh, you know downstream which are generally more on the second uh, second row and then finally in the end we uh, you know do the filling of the product so i will explain each of this uh, you know process step in little more detail so but finally if you just see in this one slide we are starting with the vial which is a vial of the living cells which have the gene to make the product and the slide is ending with the vial which is which is actually the product which goes to the market so it shows a vial finally getting converted into a vial for product so this is a little more uh, detail of the upstream process so we start with the vial like i said we have to expand it to the shake flasks then we have to expand it to the seed uh, or an inoculum bioreactors and then finally we go to the the main uh, production bioreactor or the manufacturing bioreactor as we say so in the next slide i will give you some idea about uh, what different parameters do we actually have to optimize when we are developing an upstream uh, process so generally if you think the uh, the development of an upstream process is actually of uh, of two parts so one part focuses on the optimization of the media and the feed so the the media that we use to you know uh, grow these cells plays a very very important role on how the cells will behave how will they grow how much product will they make and more importantly what will be the quality of the product so left hand side shows the media and the feed and you can see uh, nowadays we generally try to use a pure chemically defined uh, media so if you're giving a chemically defined media then we have to make sure that each and every essential component is is added so we have to give amino acids vitamins uh, trace salts we have to give lipids uh, we have to give um, uh, you know bulk salts like uh, sodium chloride calcium chloride so all these have to be provided in the right amount to make this uh, make this media there are a lot of complications in making this media because <clears throat> as as uh, written on the slide this media has close to 80 to 90 components and each of this component has a varying degree of solubility so we have glucose and sodium chloride which are very easily soluble but we have certain lipids we have certain vitamins which are very difficult to dissolve even in small quantities we cannot give uh, very you know uh, different uh, we cannot use extremes of temperature extremes of ph uh, to make these medias uh, to dissolve these components because you know this will then uh, the cells will uh, will not be able to grow under these extreme conditions so all these things have to be uh, taken into account while we are making the media and we are you know making sure that we make the right media each time for the cells to grow on the other side of the slide you see the conditions of the bioreactor so you know like two things are important the media and the feeds that you provide and the environment that you provide to the cells and the environment comes from the bioreactor so for example what is the temperature set points 
that we are trying to control, what is the pH we want to control, how much share we are giving uh, to these cells. And especially these uh, mammalian cells are more sensitive to share because they don't have a cell wall. So we have to optimize the share also properly. Uh, what levels of waste metabolites the cells can tolerate. So, you know, uh, whenever we give nutrients to the cells, the cells use the nutrients, but they make the waste metabolites. So the concentration of the waste metabolites are also very important. What is the amount of nutrients that we have to give? And the, the real, you know, exciting thing is that a very small amount of nutrients, like I mentioned, small amount of uh, magnesium, calcium, uh, manganese, iron, they play a very, very important role. And, uh, you know, they can make big differences in the quality of the protein. And the reason is because many of these uh, uh, small trace elements actually are cofactors to a lot of enzymes in the glycosylation pathway. So if, if their concentration vary, or you can uh, you know try to vary the concentration yourself to get the right glycosylation that you want so you know it is very exciting to study about the interaction and the behavior of each of uh, you know these uh, small small uh, nutrients so you know uh, to optimize the uh, process generally optimize the media right get the feeds uh, right and get the environment of the bioreactor uh, right. So these are all the two areas in which we optimize the upstream. Coming to downstream, so what happens uh, when the bioreactor or the fermenter run gets over, uh, like the diagram shows, you have uh, the product, which is the antibody inside, but you also have a lot of cells. They are living cells. There are de dead cells. There are cells which have completely lysed. Uh, there are a lot of intracellular particles which have come out. There are some nutrients which are still lying there un unutilized. There are some waste metabolites which the cells have, have made. So a combination of all this is, is called the harvest, a cell culture harvest. And now the purification uh, you know, steps have to start. So the first step on purification is to remove the cells. So either we can centrifuge and remove the cells uh, at the large scale or we can use filtration to, to remove these uh, cells. So once we have removed these cells, uh, the purification of the product starts. The first stage in uh, typically in a monoclonal antibody production is, is uh, affinity chromatography. So uh, we use the affinity chromatography uh, and uh, take out and try to bind the antibody to a ligand called uh, protein A, so and then elute the antibody out. After that, there are multiple chromatography steps. We use cation exchange chromatography, anion exchange chromatography. In some cases, we use hydrophobic chromatography. So all these stages are actually used to polish the product. And by polishing, I mean remove removing trace amounts of uh, host cell protein, trace amounts of uh, the DNA which comes from the host cells, uh, any endotoxin which can come during the process and can be harmful for the uh, for the product. So all these are the polishing steps of different chromatographies uh, which we have to do to be able to purify uh, the product. Now once all this is is done and uh, then the final stage is the filtration of of virus. And, uh, you know, this filtration is, is uh, different from the normal filtration because this is a nano uh, pore size, whereas all other sterile filtration are for uh, micro uh, size. So this is, uh, this is almost the final stage for the product where we uh, make sure that all, if any virus is there, it is uh, removed. And then after that, some stages we have to concentrate the product. So we make the product more concentrated. So if we have to do that, we have a, a filtration and ultra filtration step in between. And after the product is get gets concentrated, we take it to the filling uh, filling line. So this is you know all the downstream uh, unit operations which are typically used in a monoclonal antibody process. And in the next slide, I will show you 
you know again in in a table form what does each process step does so if you see the attribute list the first uh, column says uh, you know the host cell protein the host cell dna both of them come from the cells the dead cells any virus which can which can come the charged species like i said antibodies can form aggregates these are proteins they can form fragments so all these and and on on the second uh, column where you see cell culture that is the bioreactor step so all these things are formed in the bioreactor and then wherever you see a green it shows in different uh, purification or the downstream unit operation these get uh, removed like for example since virus can be a big risk a lot of uh, you know safety is built in uh, to take care of viruses so if you see the virus uh, step so there are four places where we make sure that the virus uh, load is is reduced during the process so uh, this is what and each step has to be optimized uh, uh, for the best condition so that it can give the right uh, yield and it can get the right product quality that we are aiming for so this this happens in the downstream process development uh, stage now like i said the third uh, process stage is the formulation and the drug product uh, development stage so here there are three important parts so first is we have to identify a formulation and the formulation will be the one which will make sure that this purified protein is stable for the whole shelf life of the product and uh, when what we mean by stability is that the quality attributes like i mentioned a lot of quality attributes uh, you know are part of uh, our characterizing a molecule so we have to make sure that for the whole shelf life for this 2 years or 3 years all these product, product quality attributes are actually uh, maintained and they are they are stable so we have to find the right formulation which will be able to do that this is an example of of a formulation you can have sodium chloride glycine you know sodium hydroxide water for injection and uh, whatever we add in the formulation apart from the drug product is called as excipient the second important part is uh, once you know the formulation you have to develop a process which will convert this purified product into a drug product so like we have upstream process downstream process you also need to have uh, a, a drug product process to be able to make sure that you you know you make the product in the right way the third step is that once you have the right product how will you make it you know safe and convenient for the patient so the product goes in different forms uh to the patients and uh, the later slides i will give some idea on on that so these are the three main areas for drug product development find the right formulation which will make it stabilize find the right process so that you can make the right product and once you have the product make a a, a right uh, you know container closure for the patient so that it is safe and convenient for them Uh, in the next slide uh, a little more detail about the formulation development so like i said uh, everything which is added to a formulation which is not the apart from the drug product is called as excipient and what we have to optimize is we have to optimize the buffers to be able to get the right ph so these uh, antibodies have uh, you know different uh, pi's we have to understand the the pi of these antibodies and then design a formulation according to that we have to maintain an uh, isotonicity so that you know the uh, osmotic pressure of the drug uh, when it is delivered is similar to what we have in our body we need to have uh, stabilizers uh, so that during the shelf life of 2 to 3 years uh, the product is is retained and these are you know proteins so you can imagine if it is a high concentration protein uh, which is lying in in a in a vial there can be tendencies that these proteins can aggregate you know their hydrophob uh, hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions can happen and these proteins can aggregate or these proteins can fragment 
so now these stabilizers help to maintain an environment inside so that these uh, these antibodies are actually not aggregated or fragmented we need to have preservatives at time so uh, because sometimes the uh, drug is delivered as multi doses so you once the uh, the it is opened uh, the preservative takes care that the drug doesn't get spoiled there are sur surfactants so which reduce the surface tension and again uh, like you know that proteins have a hydrophobic uh, part also so it can you know interfere with the uh, the plastic of the syringe it can interfere with the glass of the of the vial or the syringe so we have to make sure that we have the right surfactants to avoid these uh, you know interactions all this when all this is being done uh, how do you test that you have the right formulation so the when we say that a formulation has to last for say 2 to 3 years uh, at say 2 to 8 degrees uh, we cannot keep on testing every formulation and then come to know a result after 2 to 3 years so we do stress testing we know we do accelerated testing where we increase the temperature and uh, because and then study the protein degradation in different formulation and then choose the formulation which we find is the most stable under stress and you know higher temperature uh, higher ph uh, conditions so that helps in early screening of the formulation but uh, we have to generate data for the long term storage so storage at 2 to 8 degrees for 4 years 5 years also has to be uh, studied and during all these studies which are short term or which are long term like i said all product quality attributes have to be monitored and make sure that the formulation is able to hold the protein with the uh, quality that we have uh, you know we intend to so once we have chosen the formulation uh, we go to the drug product uh, process step so after the downstream uh, we uh, we ended by saying that we can have a concentrated uh, product uh, which is highly pure but the product is in some container it can be in a bag uh, as we see in this uh, diagram or it can be in a in a vessel and then uh, what happens in as part of drug product step we have to add these excipients which we have finalized during a formulation development step so we have to add one by one all these excipients filter it and then uh, we can store this uh, protein under the formulated conditions uh, this now the protein with all these formulation is called as a drug substance and we can store it uh, for uh, till we go into uh, filling so during all this step also once we have known the formulation uh, we still have to as part of process we have to understand how do we add these excipients these excipients have to be added either as a stock should we make a concentrated stock or should we add as powders uh, if we make a dilute stock there will be a lot of uh, dilution which will happen what is the order of addition you know the order of addition also is very plays a very important role how long should you mix, mix? because these proteins are also you know uh, shear sensitive so what is the right amount of mixing what test do you do when you are making these formulations when you are making this uh, you know product and then uh, for example in the when we are going to the drug product uh, which filter to use because you know proteins can bind to the filter that is one or the other thing which can happen is some of these uh, proteins or some of the excipients in the formulation can leach something out from the filter so because the filter also is a chemical substance so it can affect the uh, product thus the product can also affect the filter and it can leach something out of the filter which can be you know dangerous for the uh, for the product so we have to study all that uh, whether to store in a bag or a vessel or a tank uh, how do we what temperature should it be stored some of them are stored at uh, minus 20 some at minus 40 so uh, there are different stability at different temperatures how do you freeze thaw so you know that you know proteins are sensitive to freezing if you don't freeze them right the proteins can you know just uh, fall apart 
or after freezing if you are thawing them if you don't thaw them properly again they can you know uh, get uh, get degraded so what is the freeze thaw cycle how long can you uh, store this uh, uh, frozen product everything has to be uh, studied as part of making the drug product uh, process now uh, so this is an example of the drug product process where we uh, now from these frozen bags we can you know once we decide that now we have to fill the product into you know a vial or an injection uh, then we take these bags we can pool some bags or we make can have one bag to one drug product it depends on the volume that we need so once we you know make this drug product it goes through series of filtration steps as final filtration steps and then it goes to the filling machine where it gets filled into uh, a vial uh, a cartridge or an injection which is like a syringe so there also it is important to find out what testing we should do how do we mix the uh, the protein how do we uh, what testing we do before uh, filling what testing we do after filling everything has to be developed as part of of the drug product uh, process so going to the next uh, slide this is a busy slide but what we want to show from here is that uh, you know i talked about developing the formulation developing a process to be able to make the product but another uh, you know this uh, is it uh, am i audible or am i muted the last few uh, seconds uh, it was audible okay uh but should i continue or should i go back uh, only last uh, uh, for one sentence which you made uh, the comment so uh, only that if you can repeat and continue to do okay on the same slide yeah in the same slide okay okay so uh, what i said is that in the previous slide uh, we discussed how do we make a formulation then we discuss how do we make a process to be able to uh, you know convert that formulation and the uh, drug into a product uh, this slide is talking about what do we have to take care when we are choosing the final uh, we call it as a container closure uh, it can be a syringe it can be a vial the type of glass which is which is there the type of stoppers the type of capping everything has to be studied because in, uh, different proteins have different quality different excipients have different qualities and we have to make sure that we study everything and choose the best for every uh, protein on the right hand side you can see some of the st uh, tests that we have to do so like i said product related tests are aggregate oxidize impurities because you know certain amino acids can easily get oxidized uh, truncated species are fragment so there are antibodies which can lose say one arm which is like one uh, you know a light chain uh, all these have to be uh, studied there can be some uh, process related like i said some dna coming from the uh, cells some uh, Uh, protein coming from the cells everything has to be uh, removed and tested to be proven that it is removed uh, microbial safety is a very important thing and you know that is why we have to make these products in a strict gmp environment so that no artificial infection uh, you know comes uh, in the product so and any endotoxin any other uh, bio burden celerity everything has to be checked and like i said there could be some extractable leachables which can come throughout this process and we have to uh, continuously uh, monitor them that they don't get they don't infect uh, or sorry affect our product so if i go to the next slide so what we did till now is uh, uh, identify the product use the machines develop the process upstream downstream 
and formulation. So now we'll quickly go to the manufacturing of the product. And I'll just quickly cover this. Uh, so the concept is that all the work that I explained in the previous slides is developed in the lab or the pilot scale. And now we have to scale up to the manufacturing scale where you can see all the columns become bigger, the bioreactors become bigger. And this is also a very, very important uh, you know, uh, uh, skill to be developed to convert a process uh, you know, in, from a small scale uh, to be able to run it at a larger scale and run it consistently. So certain principles overall, if you see, and I'm giving an example of the upstream process right now, uh, what we do is we develop and we optimize the process in the lab so that we uh, you know, get the desired output the output it will be in terms of uh, say growth of the cells the amount of protein that we we are getting the impurities that we are getting the quality of the protein everything is optimized and we find the best uh, environment media and the process condition to be able to get the quality uh, and quantity that we want as we scale up what we try to do is can we create the same environment which we created in a small scale to a larger scale and the hope is if we are able to replicate that we will be able to preserve the the quality that we you know got it at the small scale also at the large scale so this is you know simplified objective of a scale up that you can maintain the right conditions even at a larger scale so that your output is is still the same so just another example uh, how do we do that so first we have to convert all the parameters into scale independent uh, parameters because the same you know values will not work between the scales and then it gets divided into two parts one is for example the type of the reactor uh, uh, in upstream the bioreactor and how do you operate the bioreactor what air you give what pressure you give now the type of uh, bioreactor gets fitted with a facility so which means that for every process uh, we don't make a new uh, bioreactor so uh, once a bioreactor is there in a production facility we have to try to make a process which will fit into that uh, facility and the same thing is also true for a downstream and a, a formulation uh, you know thing that there are certain things that you which are operational parameters which you can change from process to process but you cannot keep on changing the whole unit operations uh, for every process so this is generally about you know the principles that we use for scaling up uh, the process testing of the product so it like i said during whole development and manufacturing we have to continuously test the product and make sure that we are making it right and not only during the manufacturing, but also during the shelf life of the product, we have to make sure that the quality of the product is, is retained. So certain tests, uh, these are some you know, example tests that we have to we do. So on the first uh, block, you see in process. So these are the typical tests which we do during the processing. Uh, when the product is getting made in upstream, downstream, formulation, which again I said aggregates, fragments, DNA, glycosylation, virus, uh, pH, osmolarity, all these are the steps. And then, you know, after checking the uh, product moves to the next stage, then uh, DS is the drug substance. So once the drug substance is made, uh, we have a battery of tests after which we release the drug substance and the release of the drug substance is to go to the drug product facility and if you can see in the drug product side we have a lot more tests because this is the final product which is going out uh, for the patient so a lot of testing is, is part of the release for the drug product and only once all these acceptance criteria are made are passed then the product is, is set to be released on the other uh, you see the similar type of test that we have to study over the stability of the drug substance and the drug product so most of these tests are also studied for long term uh, two years three years four years it's different for different product and we have to make sure that you know these qualities are are retained 
so this is the uh, testing part uh, with this we come to the last part which is you know the uh, another very most important part for a drug development is that uh, getting you know approval to be able to make sure that the drug can be given to the patient so all this uh, you know development history that i explained uh, this is all part of cmc so we have to get compile all this data that we have generated over years of development work uh, this becomes a package and then we have to combine all the clinical data which is parallelly running like i said in the first slide different clinical trials are are done so all this package is put together and then it is submitted for uh, you know regulatory approval uh, some examples i have given here there are for different countries there are different regulatory agencies uh, like we have in india in us in europe in japan uh, ICH is, is uh, international conference of harmonization, which tries to uh, harmonize, uh, you know, uh, different uh, regulatory guidelines, uh, WHO, and then each country has its own uh, guideline, which is very specific to the need of the country. So when we develop a process, we have to make sure that uh, because Biocon develops all process uh, for global uh, markets. So we have to make sure that when we are developing any process, we are meeting requirements from India, we are meeting requirements from USA, uh, Brazil, Australia, Mexico, every country, because finally we want you know, approval in, in uh, every country. So like I said, approvals are based on dossier submission. Dossiers are you know, the full package, uh, which goes for all the work which happens when we submit these uh, packages to the regulatory agencies they review the package and if they have any you know clarification they write back to us and we are supposed to respond to that so this is called query responses and then uh, physically also the regulators come and audit the facility so if they they have to find out whether the facility is good enough uh, to be able to make a uh, good quality product so when the regulators are satisfied with all the data, all the queries that we have responded, and the facility audit. Uh, that finally leads to the approval of the uh, the drug. And after the approval, we are allowed to you know market the drug in different uh, parts of the world, depending on whichever country we have taken the approval for. So uh, I think in a in a very express way. I try to cover, you know, all the key areas for the drug uh, development uh, that we we generally go through. And then, if there are any uh, questions, I'll be happy to answer if I can. Can I come in? Uh, Mr. Ankur Bhatnagar. Thank you very much. Absolute compliments. I really enjoyed your talk. Such a Thank complex you. subject. The uh, way you presented was so clear. Grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Thank uh, you. you have brought out all the nuances from beginning to end. I have one, uh, one question. Uh, given the regulatory framework in India and difficulties with regard to trials, you know, testing, uh, including you know, facilities, the difficulty with animal trials, human trials, and all that. Uh, how do you feel, you know, compared to other countries, how easy or difficult it is to uh, kind of, you know, bring the product to this level? So uh, it is, uh, it's difficult to say easy or difficult because every country has, you know, slightly different uh, requirements and uh, which is based on, you know, the, the, uh, what that country actually uh, needs for example animal testing uh, we have a, a you know a requirement for animal testing uh, as part of uh, indian approval but what happens some of these drugs uh, they don't have the right animal model so in that case we go to the agencies and then we you know our regulatory team they discuss with the agencies that uh, for this product uh, doing this animal testing in this model will not help because this is not the right uh, animal model to be able to do that. 
so sometimes we get approval for for that and sometimes you know it's a discussion and uh, what also i think the good thing from the indian uh, regulatory side is that uh, they are open to you know discussions from the companies also so they have been taken views from the uh, from the industries so our uh, senior people from our regulatory side they have been called they are heard so i think this is appreciable that you know the uh, the indian agencies make an effort to hear the the other side and their challenges and they also involve uh, you know we uh, some of our senior people have also got involved in in regulatory guidelines framing the regulatory guidelines so i so think that is is right particip- it is very participatory yes yes so uh, mr batnagar thank you so much it was wonderful look forward thank to meeting you. you sometime please do come to the academy sure. sometime thank my, you very much my pleasure thank you very much sir uh, there is one question uh, how can we remove endotoxin can you please explain on this so endotoxin generally we uh, so there are different ways first of all we prevent the entering of the endotoxin you know that prevention is the is the key so for example starting from our water uh, the testing of the water is done if we use water for injection we make our own water we are the water uh, plant so the water is tested because water is the key it you know media is prepared in water buffers are prepared in water so we test the media and buffer and make sure that they are endotoxin free any endotoxin that can come from anywhere in the process uh, we have these chromatography steps like the anion exchange chromatography it takes care of the endotoxin and further in the uh, process like i said we keep on checking the endotoxin levels and make sure that they are controlled but you know to answer that question there are two things one is try to prevent the endotoxin coming in and the second is the uh, the anion exchange chromatography uh, step which takes care of endotoxin thank you much, sir there is one more question from milin uh, what kind of biological drugs are currently manufactured in bio- biocon biologics so we have uh, all type like in the f- beginning slide i said we can use bacteria we can use yeast and we can use mammalian cells so we use all three uh, in biocon we use bacteria to make uh, some product which is there we can see on our website uh, a peg fill grastem uh, recently got approved in uh, in usa then uh, we use pkia to make all insulins and analogs so insulin glargine aspart all these are insulins uh, and analogs of insulin we use pkia and then we make uh, monoclonal antibodies using mammalian uh, cells so there are uh, there are i think uh, three antibodies uh, from biocon which are in market and uh, one or two are under the approval stage thank you very much sir uh, there is one more question why measure the higher order structure or pro- of the proteins the question is why do we measure yes sir exactly why do we yes, measure yes. so we have to measure because uh, you know it impacts the stability of the protein if you have not made the right uh, protein in the in the beginning it can behave you know slightly uh, differently so higher order actually helps us to to say that you know from the starting the primary is the, from the sequence to the actual folded uh, protein is all made in the right uh, way and sometimes uh, some of the drugs that i didn't mention about that but we also work on uh, biosimilar drugs which are so there is an innovator uh, say antibody and we are trying to make an antibody similar to the innovator so there having the right higher order structure uh, gives the confidence that our antibody will behave very similar to the antibody which is there from the innovator so that is why it's important thank you very much sir there is one more question from mahi priya uh, does biocon works on synthetic chemical drugs also or it deals with only biological synthesis no we do uh, chemical also and uh, you know the biocon does a lot of uh, these small molecules uh, it's a different division uh, where we do small molecules uh, both we make small molecules through chemical synthesis also and also through fermentation uh, route so we do 
uh, it's a big business for biocon thank you sir what kind of in silico studies you perform for identifying the product needed uh so in silico studies we uh, generally uh, try to get different uh, cell lines so for example if we are making uh, a drug which uh, you know is, is supposed to bind certain target then we we get a cell line or make a cell line which is expressing that target and then we you know as we are making that drug we try to study the binding of that uh, our antibody to this uh, cell line we also we have to study the binding and the release so it is an absorption and desorption so all that kinetics have to be studied if you are uh, making insulin then we have to use an, uh, cell lines which are you know sensitive to the glucose uptake and we you know uh, use them to understand the insulin that we are making is working in the right way or not thank you very much sir there is one more question from participant which safety level is maintained during the process so uh, generally here uh, the safety level that we have because we don't work with the uh, virus uh, so our safety is are all for the product not uh, you know for uh, we don't have to safeguard for the virus our facilities are completely virus free so generally clean environment which is there which is uh, so all the sterile operations we do under the laminar flow the normal laminar flow and our manufacturing plants they are all uh, have these um, you know hepa filters uh, facility which is uh, under classified as uh, class 10000 facilities and that is what we maintain if there is a sterile operation that happens under the class 100 in the laminar flow type environment thank you very much sir what about pre formulation studies formulation studies are uh, yes so uh, generally before we study the formulation Uh, we try different different uh, you know like i said excipients and different conditions uh, we have to find out like i mentioned what is the right ph for our formulation what is the right uh, you know uh, uh, stabilizers for our formulation so we study these we study the nature of the protein we have to study the uh, glass transition temperature uh, isoelectric point of that protein so all these and different uh, you know form uh, pre formulations we do to narrow down the formulation that we want to now pursue a lot of pre formulation studies thank you sir there is one more question from vipin if seen any change in the protein secondary structure will it impact the protein stability aggregation quantitation yes so and it it and yeah. similarity so it will it will impact uh, and uh, like i said that uh, the protein actually goes through different steps during the process so once it is made in the upstream it goes through different uh, you know purification steps uh, formulation steps so if the protein structure is not right from the beginning uh, when the different steps have different conditions of uh, conductivity ph temperature uh, you know other uh, component so the there is a high likelihood that the protein will not be uh, stable uh, thank you very much sir now uh, all the questions there uh, and the answer sections uh, we have answered most of the questions we will take uh, offline questions and uh, send you also uh, through mail sure. now yeah. we will come to the last part of this uh, webinar uh, okay. uh, sir, sir. Bhatnagar, it was a very interesting and insightful talk. As the chairman sir told, he actually broadened the horizon of our knowledge in drug development. Uh, as we know, it is a very complex uh, thing. You made it very simple. Thank you very much. We will be requesting you to give more such talks in our.